This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is postmodernism. What it is, if it is a good thing, is it has it succeeded, has it failed? I'll be speaking with two writers, Edward Dox and Ursula Heiss, about it, and the conversation begins in a moment. Edward Dox and Ursula Heiss are my guests. Uh, the subject is postmodernism. Uh, I'd like to get a little bit of background information for the viewers for both of them. So let me ask Edward if you can give a little bit of biographical background about yourself, who you are, uh, anything you've written in general, uh, websites, and also uh, I know you wrote an essay about postmodernism. Uh, give some brief thoughts about it. So if you can give a little background, Edward, first. Hi. Yeah, my name is uh, Edward Dox. I'm a novelist um, working out of London uh, in Great Britain. Um, I've written three novels, which are published by Picador here, Open Mifflin in America. The fourth novel is out in April uh, next year, 2017. I also write uh, journalism for The Guardian newspaper here, where I write a lot of their literary criticism or some of their literary criticism and do some reviewing um, of novels for them, and I write on politics and ideas um, in many places in the British press. I wrote a big essay on uh, postmodernism, and in particular the death of postmodernism, which is my particular point of view, um, a couple of years ago. And that essay went around the world and uh, uh, created quite a, a big debate, which I'm very pleased about. Um, my view on uh, postmodernism is that that period is coming to the end, that period in human thought. Um, I'm less clear about what's replacing it, although I do have some ideas on that. Um, but I would like uh, to contend that um, in the same way as other periods in human history and human thought have a natural shelf life, and I'm talking now about um, modernism itself or classicism or romanticism, um, I think postmodernism has, has and had a natural shelf life. And I think, as I say, that that shelf life is coming to an end. But let's uh, hand over to Ursula for a minute. Ursula, if you could give a little background about yourself then. So uh, I'm Ursula Heise. I was uh, born in Germany, did grad school in and I at UCLA and so <clears throat> I started <clears throat> I started my career being hired as the uh, specialist in postmodern literature um, at Columbia University and the first book I published was called Chronos Narrative and Postmodernism and I was really interested at the time in how novels published um, from the 1960s onward you really structure a time very differently from the high modernist novels of James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, John Dos Passos, Franz Kafka, and so on. Um, and so, and more broadly, I was interested in just what postmodernism means in different art forms, in architecture, in the visual arts, in poetry, in fiction, and all of which it actually has meant pretty different things, and I think that makes it hard to sum up and hard to assess whether it's whether it's over or whether the term itself has exhausted its usefulness, but a lot of what it referred to actually actually um, lasts. Um, my work over the, the last 10 or 15 years has been focused on environmentalism and environmental narrative in particular, and so there my interest in postmodernism has taken a somewhat different shape. It's more focused on the um, engagement with um, <clears throat> with science and the way in which um, scientific authority works across different areas of public life. Um, um, of activism and of artistic creation. So let's uh, talk about uh, what postmodernism is first before we uh, debate anything. Um, the 1960s, the mid 20th century, had things uh, postmodernism, post structuralism, deconstruction, abstract expressionism in, in painting mainly, metafiction. Um, let me just get from both of you what postmodernism uh, 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 is striving to do or strove to do. Uh, and uh, before we talk about whether it succeeded or not. So let me uh, ask Edward, how do you def uh, define postmodernism vis-a-vis some of these other things I mentioned? Well, I think Ursula's right. 
in that it's a very difficult and multivalent term. But let me have a go at making uh, some general observations. It seems to me that postmodernism, uh, in its core, seeks to turn over the ideas of modernism. And of course, what's interesting about postmodernism is it's one of the few uh, movements of thought that overtly defines itself against what went before. When I say overturn, I mean this. I mean that ideas of expertise, of privileged making, of authenticity, of um, skill in some, in some cases, um, were turned over by postmodernists modernists, so that we become more interested in collage, in assembly, in the deprivileging of one narrative over another. I'll give you one example um, which makes this point very clearly, and it's from the world of dance. There's a brilliant piece of dance uh, by Carol Armitage called Drastic Classicism. And what that does is it puts on stage uh, a performance which encompasses hip hop, classical ballet, Indian dancing, all kinds of different dancing. And it puts them side by side and juxtaposes them to loud guitar music. And your experience of watching that is that you see each of the different narratives in relation to one another. And one starts to rethink classical ballet because of its juxtaposition with hip hop, for example. But also one rethinks hip hop because of its juxtaposition with classical ballet. In architecture, a very simple um, example is in London here, the Sainsbury's Wing, where we have classical styles abutted with modern styles. So this idea of deprivileging one system, one meaning, and assembling all kinds of systems and meanings around it um, is what I would call artistic postmodernism. I'll make one other small point, um, which is that I think that the political and social um, significance of postmodernism is a cousin thing to that. So we deprivilege or thinking deprivileges the classic male narrative of history, and we begin to see the gay movement, the feminist movement, all these different movements um, being being uh, brought into the public consciousness alongside the the the, the, uh, the standard, if you like, the standard movement, and postmodernism aims and seeks to, um, as I say, deprivilege, deprivilege, and destabilize those central old styles of narrative or movement in order to create new collage and make us aware of their opposites and their others. Um, that's what I think it did, and I think it did that brilliantly and has made a huge contribution to human thinking and, and moved us on uh, in many, many very, very positive ways. Um, I'll end by saying the reason I think it's, it's coming to an end is because I think something interesting has happened in the last 10, 15 years, which is that humans in, on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world are gradually getting more used to the following thoughts, which is, although my narrative has no claim to being transcendently true, I must nonetheless live within that narrative. So even though I play, say, for example, soccer, I can't say that soccer is the only game, and I can't say that there are no other games. But while I'm playing soccer, soccer is the game that I'm playing. And it seems to me that we're getting more used to that, what you might call philosophical doublethink. So we're able to inhabit and uh, give energy and meaning to our particular endeavour, whilst at the same time conceding that it's not the only endeavour. And I think that that new way of thinking spells an end for postmodernism because, in a way, it digs us out of the problem of postmodernism's corrosiveness. I'll leave it there, hand over to Ursula, and then we can debate some more. Ursula, do you agree with his definition of what, how do you define POMO versus uh, the, some of the other things I mentioned? In part. I mean, I, I do think that Ed is absolutely right that the questioning of authenticity and the juxtaposition of different narratives is crucial to postmodernism. But um, some of what you mentioned, Ed, actually to me is really typical of high modernist 
<laughs> and that collage in film and in, in fiction was a hallmark of, of high modernist narrative. Um, if you think of, say, John Dos Passos' Manhattan Transfer or James Joyce's Ulysses, I mean, one of the things that's really striking about those narratives and the way in which they innovated from the 19th century that came before was precisely that they use urban space to juxtapose radically different experiences and radically different points of view. Um, and I think what, what distinguishes modernism and postmodernism is that for the modernists, that kind of juxtaposition was still underwritten by the desire to capture a certain kind of reality. So if you look at Virginia Woolf, um, you know, her, her um, goal was clearly to capture a kind of psychological reality that she thought had not been adequately captured by the Victorian novel. For Dos Passos, um, being a communist in the 1920s, the objective was somewhat different. He wanted to, um, to depict the reality for four very different um, social classes. But the endeavor was, was similar in, in both cases in the sense that there was, the, the goal was to capture reality in a different way. Um, I think postmodern fiction, as it emerged from the 1950s onward, um, does take some of the ingredients of, post, of modernism that Ed mentioned, the juxtaposition of different narrative, the sort of relativization that's inherent, but it goes farther and it really questions that there is any shared reality at all. So take, for example, um, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, right? So it juxtaposes um, the perspectives of four different characters, but there is still a sense, even though they have very, very different experiences of their reality, there's still a sense that there is a shared reality out there, the sale of the land, the scene of Caddy and her muddy drawers that all of the characters remember in some way um, is shared across these different perspectives. But then you get um, postmodernist fiction and think of something like Clarence Major's reflex of bone structure, right? Um, so he starts his novel by telling you about um, an African-American singer who, um, who performs at different concerts, and then he tells us, oh, and one day she was found murdered in her apartment in Harlem. Okay. Um, then in the next scene, he tells us, oh, she's on her way to a concert in Moscow, and you go, oh, this has got to be a flashback. You know, that wouldn't be unusual in a high modernist novel. But the next thing you find out is, oh, she was actually killed in a plane crash on the way to Moscow. And that's postmodernism, right? Now you have two different plots that are incompatible with each other. And there isn't really a way in which you can still say that difference in the way in which the plot evolves in these two scenes is due to psychological difference. It's no longer possible to sort of say it's character and it's different characters, memories and anticipations and experiences that justify this reality. So we Reality itself, in a sense, breaks apart. Um, and you mentioned a metafiction a while ago, Dan. That's another way of sort of really breaking down um, the construction of narrative worlds and their reality. So if you get something like John Barth's um, Lost in the Funhouse or his Menelaid, right, where you have stories layered within stories, layered within stories, layered within stories. Um, and at the end, as a reader, you don't even know anymore which is supposed to be the narrative world that you believe in. So that's very, very different from what happens in the high modernist novel. So that's one way in which that questioning of authenticity, or I would say almost also like the sense of a shared reality really gets changed so that you go from um, a questioning of reality, shared reality that is grounded in individual. Hello, Ursula. Reality that's really unmoored from that. Yep. Yeah, um, you just faded there for a second. Um, uh, one of the things Edward mentioned was uh, the word skill, and this is one of the things that I do want to uh, talk about because, uh, to me, art is communication. It's communication at its highest level, and it's more important, for example, if you're in narrative fiction, to get behind a character's eyes to see or understand what he or she is feeling rather than, say, being endlessly describing how beautiful their blue eyes are. And I think in a lot of modern art and postmodern work, uh, from Duchamp's, uh, you know, uh, urinal on, we get more of authorial intent 
rather than what's there. And uh, for example, I've always been, I've always thought the new critics were absolutely right in their approach to art. They just didn't apply their own standards to themselves. And that's why new criticism has been sort of tossed to the ash heap. A work of art has to stand alone, for example. I want to give a couple of examples uh, that, that could uh, later on as we uh, go uh, that would get that. Well, let me, let me start here. For example, I've got two books here, two trilogies here. Uh, your aforementioned Dos Passos USA trilogy and then Austin's New York trilogy. And I think the USA trilogy is has moments of brilliance in it. I wouldn't say overall that it's a great work, but I think it's it's got moments of it. Whereas Austin's is, is very limp. And yet there's uh, one is not considered postmodern. One is considered postmodern. And Austin's book, uh, most famously, I forget which of the books it is, he, he uses his own name as a character uh, within. And that's the basic whole conceit of that one book. I forget which of the three it is. In Dos Passos' uh, USA trilogy, for example, he uses newsreels, uh, visual versions of newsreels, of photographs, of whatnot, a collage. And to me, Oss's book is just pretentious preening and showing off his work, whereas Dos Passos, whether he succeeds or fails, is actually moving things forward. Yet Dos Passos' book, I would say, is a far more adventurous and and takes far more risks than Austin's uh, trilogy. And yet postmodernists I've read have defended this book. Well, this is what Austin was going for. And I, I'm just using Austin as an example. I could use hundreds of other examples. Um, Edward, let me start with you since you mentioned skill. This is one of the things I think that frustrates a lot of people in and out of the arts like myself. If you look at abstract expressionism, the visual equivalent, and you can see the drip paintings of Pollock, versus, say, you know, Salvador Dali, who would, was going in different directions, but you could still uh, hang on to things, uh, is one of postmodernism's failures in that it, it begs authorial intent over actual accomplishment then? Um, well, I'd say three things to that. The, the first is um, it's not really a failure of postmodernism that it robs its audience of a standpoint from which they feel confident to judge the work. In a strange way, that's a success uh, of postmodernism in that it, it deliberately, at its, in its best incarnations, sets out to do precisely that. Um, second thing I'd say is that actually the novel or literature is, is probably the most difficult or certainly the muddiest arena to assess postmodernism. And this is probably for another episode, but but the nature of the form, um, its 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 own elasticity is very narrow. Whereas in architecture, in dance, and in making generally, I can we could all be very clear about what was postmodern and what wasn't. The third thing I'd say is I'm a, I'm going to agree with Ursula about what she says very eloquently about modernism, but just add this that I think the difference with postmodernism is it's an epistemic challenge. It's not it's not collage for collage's sake. I'm not making a, a value judgment about Don Passos's book, which or, or the trilogy, which I very much enjoyed. I'm not saying one should judge it badly or, or well for that. But but the difference in a postmodern um, artistic endeavor is there is, is uh, in the best form is that there is some element to it which seeks to overturn um, the our epistemic sense of meaning rather than merely not merely that's unfair but rather than to to illustrate through difference finally to just come in there at the end um with your with your struggles with Oster, Oster, um, I'm no fan of Oster either, and I think he's hideously overrated as a writer. But um, I think what you're touching on is one of the great problems of postmodernism, which is that once one takes a relativistic view of art or thinking or politics, the ultimate extension of that, the ultimate corrosion of that position, is that one cannot assert anything. So the strange paradox of postmodernism is that it actually looks like, at its nth degree, a strange form of conservatism. Because what you end up having to say is we cannot say things about this other thing because our two narratives are so far apart, we can't be meaningful. Um, and I think that that's what began as a great 
revolution in thinking paradoxically ends in a rather conservative and small view of the world which is impossible to live by which is why my sense is that postmodernism is passing because we are as i said in my previous uh, um, previous bit um, we are learning to live with the fact that we do have to make value judgments at the same time as accepting that our value judgments are not uh, transcendent Ursula, uh, do you think, uh, as I had mentioned, that uh, uh, postmodernism uh, is putting authorial intent ahead of actual accomplishment? No, I think I would disagree with that because um, I do think that there are certain postmodern novels that are that are incredibly accomplished, and I don't know if Oster would be at the top of my priority list there. But um, um, I, I mean, I think you're you're right in the sense that, especially in certain forms of postmodern music and poetry, there is sometimes an emphasis on the procedure. For example, if you read any of John Cage's poetry or you listen to his music, there's certainly um, an, an emphasis on what is the mechanism by which I arrived at the final piece that's as important to understand as just listening to the to the piece itself. Um, but I think the um, <clears throat> I think um, we should point out that um, yeah, I, I, just to elaborate a little bit on, on a couple of the really Really, um, I think thoughtful things that that Ed said. Um, I, I do. It's true. I mean, for me, it's it's high modernism that was about um, that was about different modes of knowledge and memory um, and how they approach the real. Whereas what Ed, what you call the the corrosive, or or what um, it sounds like you consider the impasse of postmodernism, is that it creates, but then at the same time undoes narrative worlds for us. So it's really sort of about. Um, well, if you want to use that big word about the ontological world making that happens through storytelling, and and it's true that because postmodern fiction doesn't let us rest comfortably with a narrative world it's con it constructs, it then becomes very difficult for the reader to position him or herself in any kind of stable position to that. And one of the most obvious examples of that would be um, Italo Calvino's About a Winter's Night and Traveler, which I think is a brilliant book, but it is brilliant in the sense that it anticipates all the positions that the reader could take with regard to what is presented in the book or Gil Sorrentino's um, uh, Mulligan Stew, um, where you have all the, the rejection letters from the publishers and you have the critics voices incorporated into the novel. So it doesn't let you actually take any position that hasn't already been occupied. And that's profoundly uncomfortable. Um, I think with, with Oster, the problem is a little bit different. I think there, the deconstruction that happens of literary character is profoundly uncomfortable, that we're at every step, um, say in City of Glass, so, so uh, aware of the fact that that the characters are just constructed and that the detective is trying to understand and construct another character of whom he'll only ever have little bits and pieces in which he'll not be able to put together into a psychologically realist portrait. That's sort of what leaves you very uncomfortable there, that actually the, um, the, the detective narrative does not lead you to any deeper truth. It just leads you to pattern after pattern, to surface after surface, but it doesn't actually let you grasp the world. Um, in a, it doesn't promise you a deeper understanding of the world. Um, so I think that's, that's, and I think that is both the strength and the weakness of postmodernism. I think its strength is that it opened up that possibility of inhabiting and looking at the world, looking at reality from a multiplicity of different perspectives. At the same time, what that takes away is precisely what Ed alluded to, that the, the, the sort of piercing through to a deeper meaning that is then positioned as the unquestioned truth or ultimate authenticity of the narrative. That's sort of the deeper pleasure or the deeper fulfillment, accomplishment, if we want to use your word, um, Dan, that I think postmodern fiction denies us. But I think it's also at this point probably a good idea to point out that what was called postmodern fiction, at least in the American context, really changed from the 1960s 
1960s to the 1990s. So in the 1960s, you had this eruption of metafiction, these um, layered fictions that deprive you of an ultimate sense of narrative reality. Um, later on, um, in the 1980s, it actually shifted to, say, um, the novels of Toni Morrison, Bharati Mukherjee, a completely different kind of fiction that is actually either modernist or even realist in an earlier sense of the word, but that unearths voices and histories that had not been heard before. And that's one of the main meanings of postmodernism, I think both in the arts and in literature, that postmodernism takes on starting in the 1980s, where then you could, you know, Paul Auster and Toni Morrison get both get referred to as postmodern, and they both are, but in very different senses of the word. And that kind of postmodernism is, of course, I mean, I think neither of these kinds of postmodernism actually is dead in the sense of not making its influence felt anymore. So certainly, you know, the writing of alternative histories um, and the foregrounding of the multiplicity of historical realities is still an ongoing project. And even the project of metafiction, which you could, which you could argue maybe exhausted itself in a certain sense with um, with uh, David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest and Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves in the 1990s, you know, both of which sort of take the metafiction strand to an extreme where it becomes almost unreadable. Um, but at the same time, um, here in the U.S., we've just been watching the new TV series Westworld, um, which is about, um, you know, a theme park um, that builds on old themes of the Western and is populated with robots. Um, this is based on a film that was a very postmodern sort of simulation of a reality that then gets overturned and undercut through the rebellion of the robots who represented the um, Western characters in the in the in the film. Um, but which itself was based on a Michael Crichton novel. So you already had that, that layering and retelling of stories that also is a hallmark of postmodernism. Well, now we have this expanded into a TV series where you not only have the gradual and by now almost stereotypical, you know, coming into awareness and coming into authentic being of the cyborgs robots, but you also have the story of the customers, the clients who come into the into the theme park to experience an alternative reality that may then reveal something about their own authentic selves to themselves or not. Um, and the question throughout the series is whether that actually happens and whether this experience at the theme park re reveals true selves or just selves that the, that the clients want to be. And then you have the layer of the creators of the theme park the storytellers, the makers, who have their own objectives and their own wish fulfillment fantasies in creating characters and in creating scenarios and in creating new narratives. So there you have metafiction spun out once again at multiple levels and with unprecedented sophistication. And I got to say, it still makes for awesome storytelling and awesome viewing. So there is a way in which, I mean, I, I agree in the sense that I don't use the term postmodern so much anymore just because most of the time I think it has come to mean so many different things that it's difficult to make it do useful work in any particular context. But I think the modes of postmodernism and some of the aesthetic strategies and some of the narrative practices actually are alive and well, both in the sense of the layering of metafiction and the destabilization of reality and the other sense of postmodernism, postmodernism which is actually bringing home other kinds of reality. I think, I think um, what, I, what I should... I should um clarify slightly what I mean by saying that I think it's at its end. I mean I mean more this, that it's it's at the end of its dominance. So in the same way as we are all um, a little bit classicist, we're all a bit medieval, we're all a bit romantic, we're all a bit modernist, we're now all a bit postmodern. And so what I mean by that is that it, it, it's retreated from being, as it were, the preeminent and dominant intellectual and artistic idea of our time to being one in the palette. So, for example, to just switch to music, Lady Gaga uses postmodern ideas all the time. 
but Adele doesn't. Um, and it's it's as if postmodernism is taking its place in the history of uh, ideas rather than occupying the centre ground. I mean, I'm very interested in and and here have um, lots of ideas and, and and kind of no certainty at all um, about what I think is is being born. But I think something very interesting is being born, and I think we see that in two different things which are impact probably uh probably the same side of this of a different coin on the one side a return to the idea of specificity of authenticity and of the idea of craft skills and making so if you watch brands now i'm talking advertising now they advertise that quality they advertise authenticity they advertise advertise making if you watch rock bands on Facebook, they advertise the fact they can actually play the guitars. If you if you look around in the world of art, you're seeing again this return to craft skills, specifics rather than collage, rather than the artist is dead. So that's one side. Um, on the other side, um, you we, we have become obsessed with truth and lies, and we see that obviously in the political arena, both here with the rolling calamity that's Brexit, and I'll, I'll leave you to characterise Donald Trump, but on this side <laughs> of the Atlantic, we are, we are locked into a, a, what, what seems to me a, a, a new discussion, and that discussion seems to me the, the bastard child of postmodernism, and this discussion centres on what is true and what is not true, and does it matter either way? And I feel that we're reaching for some new uh, way of expressing ourselves or thinking about the world, which encompasses that. It's, as, it's almost as if we, we all agree on the postmodern challenge, but now we must forge a new set of ideas that deal with the fallout of it. I, t I totally agree with that. And I mean, in the US, that's in a sense, a debate that's been going on since the 1980s. I mean, some people actually referred to Ronald Reagan as a postmodern president because uh, he wasn't always able to tell the difference between fact and fiction, like about whether IBM missiles once sent on their way to the Soviet Union would be recallable and things like that. And that's where even some of the most hardcore theorists of postmodernism asked, well, is is the confusion between, between fact and fiction um, actually helpful to any but in the once it comes down to the real world, and that's a that's a um, uh, a problem that has re-exploded with the profusion of fake news um, that that has taken place here in our recent um, uh, election campaign and um, the speculation about the, how that might have inflected the electoral results. And that brings us onto a slightly different dimension of postmodernism, which is the which is the critique of science, and that that was sort of in the more philosophical realm and the area of studies of science, technology, and society, the SDS realm, that was really more the core of postmodernism, which was the, the the questioning of scientific authority, not so much in the sense that, you know, um, people were questioning whether aspirin cures headaches, right? That's sometimes the way it gets popularized. It was not so much about questioning the facts that science put, puts forth in and of itself, but the question of what is a fact? What is that concept? And is the, the notion of a fact itself the product of a particular culture and of a particular perception of reality? Um, and so that's, you know, that that obviously became one of the main strands of, of philosophy, sociology, anthropology, with the work of Bruno Latour and actor network theory in the in the 1980s. And in some sense was brought into crisis by Latour himself. He wrote this uh, well-known piece in 2003 um, called Has Critique Run Out of Steam, where um, he questioned, and this was under our, um, under the, the uh, first term of the, of the Bush administration here, where all of a sudden you had um, the skeptics of science occupying the White House. Um, and Bruno Latour asking, well, you know, when you have a president who questions the scientific consensus, 
around climate change for political and economic purposes has that kind of postmodern critique of science actually turned against itself and is it no longer useful and even counterproductive politically and i think it's important to realize that the answer to that is not automatically yes and we need to return to some uncritical affirmation of science. That's what's happened here in the circles that I um, uh, run around in a lot. So among environmentalists, there's sort of a very strong reaffirmation of, oh, we have to believe science, we have to believe the climate scientists in particular, in the face of a massive campaign of disinformation and denial um, on the part of major corporations and intermittently on the part of the, uh, of the American government itself. And so the question is, that that's, I think, um, where some of the questions that Ed mentioned about what do we do with a legacy of postmodernism and its legitimate questioning of science, how do we, um, how do we deal with that um, in concrete political context? And where does it make sense to say, no, we actually need to coalesce again around, um, around whatever the scientific consensus Well, I want to get back to what the, the, oh, I'm sorry. The same uh, yeah. I, I wanted to get back to what Edward had talked about conservatism, because uh, that's a key point that I wanted to bring out. But before I did do, I wanted to go back to something Ursula said and uh, two writers she mentioned specifically. And I think it keys to, to what, at least in literature, uh, why the term postmodernism uh, almost is doomed to failure. And the first of the writers you mentioned was Toni Morrison. And even when she had, I think, some some quality in her work in her sort of Solomon through jazz period, uh, forgetting the last 20 years of Oprah direct that she's written, um, is to call her postmodern, uh, when she doesn't really use any uh, literary techniques, it, it seems to be mixing up uh, terms. Uh, I could call her a multicultural writer, certainly, uh, in, ter in terms of bringing things in, like there's the Andersonville passage in Beloved. Um, but to call her postmodern uh, when her, her fiction is pretty straightforward, it's pretty much emotion first rather than intellect first, even in her best works, seems to me to be uh, smearing ter terminology. And the second writer you mentioned uh, David Foster Wallace, Ursula, you even said unreadable, which I think most people who read Infinite Jest or any of his other stuff would translate as bad, very bad writing, because uh, I, I, when I reviewed that book, I mean, I could have literally had three-page swaths of nothing but cliches, <laughs> and nothing is done to undermine those cliches, and I'm a poet and a damn great one at it. I know how to undermine cliches and whatnot. And the and even though I'm I just railed against authorial intent, the very fact that I recently read his uh, the bio that was written of him a few years ago is that he had no clue what to do with this work uh, suggests that just like with Morrison calling her a postmodernism is extending that terminology outward, someone like F Foster Wallace. You know, what, whatever you want to say about Dos Passos and the USA trilogy, whether it succeeds or not, there is the, the, he was trying something and he succeeded in some things. When you look at an infinite jest, I mean, it's just plain garbage. Uh, so I'll just throw that out there about uh, if you want to address Morrison first and then Wallace. So, um, yeah, Tony Morrison, I think it's an, it's an interesting case. I, I um, quite agree that the meaning of postmodernism changes crucially there and that's why when i teach classes on postmodern literature um i always try to show these different stages in which the term is used and i see my uh my job as a literary critic um not so much to say this is the right use or this is the wrong use of the term but to show that from the 1980s on this is one of the main things that has gotten associated with postmodernism. Now, you and I agree that in terms of literary strategy, um, this is something very different from, say, John Barth or Gil Sorrentino or some of the um, Raymond Fetterman, some of the metafictionalists from the 1960s and 70s. But there is nevertheless a shared objective behind it, which is to destabilize um, assumptions about our shared reality. So Toni Morrison, too, wants to destabilize our assumption of what our history was and what our current lived reality is by showing us what history looks like 
from an African-American perspective. And in terms of literary strategy, I do think, yes, it is very different from some of the white male um, metafiction writers. On the other hand, Beloved is an interesting case in point where I think um, there is actually an interesting experiment where she stages a conflict between, on one hand, um, highlighting the, a different reality, a different history, and the brutal realities of slavery. And on the other hand, the supernatural beliefs of Sethi, um, the protagonist, whom the reader is invited to take as reality at some point. So there is a realist and an anti-realist strategy whose conflict, I think, is staged in really fascinating ways. Well, let me just so ask you, so Ursula, much. Ursula, Ursula, yeah. let me just ask you one thing. I'm sorry, but couldn't you say the same thing about Tristram Shandy uh, 200 years plus ago? Absolutely, that and I think Tristram Shandy is a postmodern novel of a letter. And I mean, look, us literary critics love to go into these big historical schemes, but one of the big, one of the big historical arcs about the development of the novel that evolved from postmodernism is actually to say that maybe the 19th century novel and its particular brand of realism, which we've always yeah, in a certain tradition of literary criticism that we've taken to be sort of the, 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 the ground level, the, the sort of foundation of what the novel is, may have been a historical exception. And maybe um, the novel was actually metafictional from its start, go even mm -hmm. further back to Don Quixote, yeah. you know, a sort of proto-novel, right. but which is extremely metafictional, like it plays with these narrative, narrative levels and embeddings and the destabilization of reality by fiction of all things. And for example, um, if you from, look from the start, so, so there's actually, you know, from, from Cervantes to Stern um, to John Barr, um, there is actually, you know, an arc of, uh, of self-referential reflection on the medium that is part of the, that is part of the history of the novel, just as realism is. Then, Dan, I would, I would, I would come back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, which is that there is a difference with postmodernism, because postmodernism is an existential threat. It's an epistemological threat to to the received order. Tristram Shandy employs, I know this is uh, ahistorical, but for the sake of the conversation, employs or deploys um, the kind of tropes and traits we see in postmodern literature, but its intention is very different. Whereas the intention of um, a postmodern artist in 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 all forms. So, for example, the AT and T Tower in Manhattan, um, yeah. the Carol Armitage that I've just talked about, um, or uh, in in uh, in ceramics. There's the the intention, the 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 effort, the artistic vector, if you like, is is to tear down. The epistemology of the actual art form is to say that this art form itself makes no sense. That the the manner in which we receive and consider the work makes no sense. We must rethink it. Whereas um, Smollett and Fielding and all of those guys, that's not that's not their author. That's not their point of departure. It's a very different point of departure that postmodern modernism has. What the AT and T Tower, which I'll just remind your listeners, uh, is, is, is it's a building with a, a broken pediment uh, at the top in Manhattan, with an art cut into it. And what it's that's a Chippendale, right, it's a Chippendale finish. That's <laughs> right. What it what it does, is it says it says to all the modernist buildings, the skyscrapers, it says something very powerful to them because it says the illusion was that there was no, that there was an illusion. But actually, there's no illusion. It's all playful. It's all just about power. And we might as well have a pediment as opposed to uh, a blocky skyscraper. And that seems to me a very different thing uh, in the soul of the artist. Postmodernism is, is, is deeply radical and revolutionary. It's not, it's not conservative, as I would say Smollett and Stern and those guys are. Well, let me just end it there, and I want to pick up that thread in our next segment about uh, intent and, and truth, and I want to get back to your comment about the conservatism of postmodernism, and we'll do that in a moment. Uh, continuing on with our conversation, one of the things I wanted to pick up on, uh, and uh, Edward, since uh, you're going to have to go in about 20, 25 minutes, uh, I want to focus on a couple of the things that you said. Um, 
when I hear intent, I always shake my head because artists lie. And when 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 and and the I, the idea of intent uh, assumes that art is truth, and art certainly is not truth. Or art, uh, for example, uh, you know, if I if if I would describe what's going on now, I could say. Uh, Dan is interviewing Ed and Ursula via Skype. That's the baseline reality. If I say the, the, what I say, Dan is interviewing Ed and Ursula via Skype, that's either true or not. Truth is fundamentally different from reality. Reality is the thing that undergirds everything. Truth is always a commentary. So when, for example, I recently read a book where Willa Cath was saying that she had no political intent in my Antonia. Uh, uh, she was just, you know, p p you know writing a, about a, a woman in her past. That's obviously bullshit. She knew what she was doing. She was a terrific writer and she knew what she was doing. So artists lie. So when we talk about truth and intent, I, as a critic, I'm never going to deal with truth because I know that I'm dealing with a load of shit. Hopefully it's good shit, good bullshit that I'm dealing with. I'm more concerned with quality, good and bad versus truth or not truth. So let me just throw that out to, out to both of you. Uh, Ursula, if you want to go first uh, and then Ed. Yeah, I think intent is a is a really tricky category um, because in some cases we know what the author's intent is, and in many other cases, especially historically, of course, uh, we don't. Um, but I wanted to come back to something that that Ed said, um, which is about um, sort of the the challenge to our understanding of reality, what you call the revolutionary dimension of postmodernism. Um, I agree with that, but um, but it's also, it's, it's hard to sometimes tell apart what's just play and what is real revolution, right? Um, and I'm not sure that, that we know that so much for sure about those 18th century writers either, because I mean, you could say that Stern in some sense does um, for his playful novel actually confront us with some of the realities of time and how it's represented in language and a narrative um, that do also rub you up against um, against experience of reality. And, and conversely, um, with postmodernism, I mean, it, it depends on who you look at. Um, with John Barth, I get a sense of, of play, mostly, not a sense of political revolution. Um, so the, the sense of... of um, epistemic onslaught or destabilization of reality is a byproduct of the play rather than its main intent, so far as I understand it's fiction. But you go to somebody else, like, um, uh, to move away from the Tommy Morrison example, who's, who's just one, one, um, uh, one example among many of the later kinds of postmodernism that emerged in the 1980s. Take Teresa Akyam Cha's Dictate, which is not at all realist and not at all conventional in the way it combines um, passages of poetry, passages of prose, photography, acupuncture diagrams, Chinese characters that are all sort of um, juxtaposed in the text. And that text, you could argue, in some sense, in its intent, is no different from, from Toni Morrison's in the sense that it tries to convey a different reality of what is it's like to be a Korean American, what it's what it was like um, to live for um, the protagonist's parents, to live through a particular period of, of, um, of South Korean history, what the immigration experience was like. But the literary means are, are, are totally different. Um, and the same thing with, with architecture. Um, so, um, Ed, you mentioned um, uh, the AT&T building, which is one of the um, prime examples, they also always post an architecture from the 1970s. Um, and, and there is that sense, I mean, you could argue that there too, there's a sense of play, right? Oh, I'm putting this Chippendale top on, on at, at the tip of what's for all intents and purposes, a very a very um, conventional, high modernist, Bauhaus, international skyscraper. But think of that building. But when you think of the whole strand of postmodern architecture that originated from Brown and Venturi in the 1960s, the sort of learning from Las Vegas, um, there is actually not just play, but a political intent there, right? To sort of um, not just go back to classical architecture, but to take inspiration from vernacular architecture, from um, local local elements of architecture, and from the popularism and vulgarism of 
a hot dog stand from Las Vegas architecture, right? I mean, Browns, Robert Browns, and um, uh, 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 Scott, uh, Brown and Venturi's famous book, Learning from Las Vegas, was all about um, giving a different twist to architecture by looking to different models and by being, in some sense, more democratic in the inspirations for architectural models. So I think the, the playfulness and the seriousness, the serious political effects, if not always intense, of postmodern art and literature are always sort of in a strange dialectic with each other. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that at all, but I, I think I'd make, I'm making the point that um, what postmodernism says um, with its, its, its challenge to the mainstream and its, its promotion of the politics of difference is it says something very different to the Enlightenment and to Romanticism and to Modernism. It says it is impossible to stand apart from the position from which you criticize. There is no transcendent existential meaning. There is only what you say from the position that you're saying it. And that seems to me a, a very radical and seriously revolutionary rebuff to, to the previous currents of intellectual thinking in the West. Because it, and, it, can I it, ask you a question about that? Yeah. Because I think that's, uh, that's totally true, I agree, but then do you think that also underwrites what you talked earlier about as the return to authenticity, the return to craft, to skill? Yeah. I think that's all happening. You're totally right about this. I mean, in the U.S. now, you can't sell a granola bar without having some narrative about how it was made yeah. and how authentic the farm is that it came from. But are all of these attempts to return to authenticity and to kind of conventional storytelling and authentic origins and things like that, do you think they're still underwritten by that postmodern consciousness that actually I we do. are still, we have relativized all of that? And is there really any retreat from that? No. And is that then... That's why I say that, that my view is not, um, I'm, I'm often mis, misrepresented as, as saying that postmodernism is, is dead, and uh, that was indeed the headline that the sub-editor put on the piece. Um, that's why I said, I, I don't think it's dead. What I think is that it's, it's taking its place in the palette of ideas. I so, totally agree with that, yeah. Yeah, so that, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't buy a coffee now without sort of 16 pages of discourse on why this coffee is the world's most authentic coffee. And how it will save the planet. Yeah, and, and, and so specificity and authenticity are right back. And that's across cultures. You know, you often hear here, uh, if you read a menu in, in an Indian restaurant, it'll say, our, you know, our, our chicken is sourced from such and such a place and we did this and it was hand reared and then three people read James Joyce to it before it was finally and humanely killed and brought here to the, and so on and so on. You, you just read this endless biography of the chicken that you're eating in order to establish uh, authenticity and truth. Um, so what I, what I think is happening is that it's not that postmodernism is dead, it's just that what people much younger than me are doing, and I'm talking now about teenagers, is they're saying, okay, there is every narrative in the world. We accept postmodernism's legacy because it's clearly true. There is, there is the, 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 the Indian narrative, the Korean narrative, uh, the Somali narrative. Of course that's right. But nonetheless, here am I selling coffee. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell coffee in a, in a non-ironic way. Now, 20 years ago, you would have sold coffee ironically. You would have said, the world is crazy. I'm ironically selling coffee. But kids don't do that anymore. What they say is, yes, the world is crazy, but I'm going to sell you coffee and mean every bean of it. And that seems to me something new and different, which I haven't yet fashioned a coherent word for or a, even a coherent paragraph for. Well, Edward, it's Edward let me... not what it was before. Let me, I want to get to a point before you have to go, but uh, one of the things that I think is a problem with uh, you know these so-called narratives uh, is that you end up with, for example, most gay fiction being about the sex act rather than the the emotions and the internal parts of the the person. You end up with someone like Jhumpa Lahiri, for example, writing stories that 
are the same bored New York intellectuals that John Cheever wrote about, except having Indian spices littered throughout the story. And you don't get any deeper sense of the person. But I wanted to get back to, to what you had said initially about uh, uh, Pomo being a conservative movement. I've often thought it's like a priesthood. I think modernism was freeing. And then in the wake of, say, post-colonialism in the 60s, there was a decided attempt to make art, take it away from the masses and make it something that was mystical, that, that well, your average person couldn't get to. Uh, I think not, of, for I'm example... Saying, go, wait. I'm not saying that it's... Uh, it's I'm saying it... Well, I'd say two things to that. I'd, I'd say that there's there's every kind of gay fiction. It's not... That, that, I wouldn't agree with you there that, that, it, that postmodernism creates... I mean, a, a great friend of mine, a great writer, Alan Hollinghurst, writes... I would say extraordinary fiction, which is is multivalent and, and uh, very emotional and also very intelligent. So I don't think postmodernism narrows things down in that way. Um, I think postmodernism explodes things. I also would say I, I only mean that it's it's conservative in the following way. I firmly believe, as I've said, that it it begins with great revolution and it begins in a great existential challenge. What I, what I mean when I say it's become conservative is if you follow postmodernism to its uh, intellectual end, what you arrive at is uh, three or six or seven billion fractured narratives, none of which can assert themselves against each other, and so therefore all of which blush before coming into the arena of ideas. And what that looks like from the outside is, is actually conservatism again, where nobody can really do very much and the status quo must remain the same. But I definitely don't think it began like that. I think it began, as I've said, um, in, a, in a great and serious revolutionary challenge, and actually a very welcome revolutionary challenge to the complacency of pretty much every, every form of human thinking. And I think the first... 20, 25 years, and I know that that's a very fluid term because it's different in each art form, but the first 20, 25 years of postmodernism, as it hits various art forms and various politics, is among the most interesting and energy-filled and worthwhile and tremendous um, thing that's ever happened to us. I just think that now it's, it's, it's so fractured the world, it's so, it's so splintered the narrative, that we are no longer finding it a, a useful banner under which to march. But hasn't it, it hasn't it descended into gimmick art? I'll give you an example. Have you ever read uh, uh, the Dictionary of the Khazars by Pavich's? It's a book that's marketed as two books with just one sentence difference. And putting aside the quality of the rest of the work or whatnot, it, 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 it becomes this sort of Clement Greenberg yeah, abstract expressionist thing that, that oh, it's got one I'm sentence difference. I'm not defending... Late postmodernist works um, from an aesthetic point of view. I'm, I'm merely saying that the that the as it were that the, the necessary endpoint of the journey that begins with the postmodern explosion is, if you like, a descent into seven billion different voices, some of whom are producing great work, some of whom are producing nonsense. Um, but but that is that is almost. A, a necessary conclusion when your when your when your birth when your beginning is the confrontation um, against the assertion of any one discourse. Okay. This is where it ends up, and that and that's why I say I think what's really interesting in the world now, or certainly in the West or in places that I've travelled and written about, is that, and I would include the Far East in that, um, is that that people are are no longer content to be merely gestural or merely silly or merely collage I mean, they feel the need to revivify their lives with, um, with meaning, with craft skills, with authenticism. And that seems to me a, a, a new thing. It's a new thing. Okay. Well, Ursula, if you could just take a couple of minutes, then I want to let Edward have a final say before he goes. So if you can just in three or four minutes respond to Edward and me. Absolutely. No, this has been, this has been, uh, I think, a fascinating exchange that 
that that speaks to a lot of the things that I'm thinking about and struggling with in my current work on environmental literature and culture. Um, so I think, um, and you're right, I mean, one, one extreme logical end of postmodernism is the fracturing of reality into all of these different voices, different histories, and without any standpoint from which you could judge the relative validity of them, right? And, and um, one thing that came up um, when you said, okay, so there's 7 billion voices and some of them produce great work and some of them produce nonsense. But the question for postmodernism would be, who is the who is the person who judges which is great work and which is nonsense and what are the criteria that go into that, right? So you go into these spirals of, of reflection on what, your, um, on what your criteria are. But I think there is another and maybe less disabling outcome of postmodernism and that's um, sort of uh, not denying reality and but but living in that struggle between some of the the boundaries i would say um some of the the, the facts that reality imposes on us along with the multiplicity of voices um and i mean i just uh, published a book in in august that's called imagining extinction the cultural meanings of endangered species and the, the almost 10 years of work that led up to that was reading the science um reading of, of endangered species and extinction of the current biodiversity crisis um which in some sense is is very real even as then you know as you read the science as you read the popular science as you read um the fictions the poetry um or you look at the photographs the films both documentary and feature films the video games the musical compositions i, I mean the sheer proliferation of work around endangered species that expresses that concern over a part of the natural world that humans are currently putting in danger um, is amazing. And so in that work, um, you run precisely into that, that on one hand, um, you have a science that um, where some of the most basic terms that define that debate, um, species, biodiversity, are actually not well defined and not easily measurable, even by the scientists themselves. And there's considerable debate among scientists as to what the exact extent of biodiversity crisis is, which taxa it affects, and so on, and how we would even begin to measure this. Um, and you could go all the way to the very, very differential impacts that biodiversity conservation has had in the global north and the global south, where often, you know, endangered animals are being preserved at the price of putting local communities in danger. Um, so, so you have all of these, um, you know, all of these uh, difficult grapplings with reality that clash then with the sense of urgency and with a sense that something is irreversibly changing in the natural world and all of these different stories and all of the scientific disagreement in some sense keep us from doing actually doing anything about it and so I think one to me one of the more positive legacies of postmodernism and I totally agree that it's not a banner that we march under anymore you put that really well and i don't anymore i don't use the terms but the term that much anymore but but i think living in that tension between on one hand the urgency of political and biological and ecological realities um and on the other hand not forgetting about the legacies of modern of postmodernism and how important it is to look at what these realities look like when you sit in different cultural realities when you have different historical memories i think is really indispensable and you see that in in just the same way now in um with climate change amitav ghosh just published a really interesting um book of, of three connected essays called The Great Derangement, where he talks about what he perceives as the inability of, of the novel and its uh, calculus of realism and probability to deal with the unprecedented challenges of climate change. Uh, or, Ursula, totally if I could just... about the conventional novel, but yeah. then leaving out all the popular forms that have actually I think to some extent efficiently dealt with this new scenario. Uh, Ursula, I just want to give Edward uh, a, a few minutes to wrap up his thoughts and then we'll continue Absolutely. on. So Edward, uh, if you could just uh, sum up in, in two, three, four minutes, whatever you have, uh, your ideas, and then I'll move on with Ursula. Great, thanks. Well, I mean, I've put a lot of it across. I think uh, my overall view is that um, we owe postmodernism um, a tremendous intellectual real-world debt 
um, you would have to be from the peculiarly recondite right wing of politics or oddly religious not to realise that the politics of um, difference, um, the feminist agenda, the gay rights agenda, LGBT, LGBT agenda, um, all these different agendas, um, the African, the Indian and the Far Eastern agendas have been both promoted and celebrated and better understood through the action of, of um, a postmodernist critique. So I would always say that postmodernism began um, with great revolutionary fury and had many, many great real world advantages. But my position is that I think that those, um, the end game of that great remaking is, is now upon us. And as I said before, we have 7 billion people all singing um, different hymns. Um, and the problem faced by, by human beings on, on one planet spinning in space is that in order to move forward to, for our best collective endeavor, we are unfortunately in a, in, a, in a position of having to achieve consensus, or at least a working consensus. And so therefore, um, it strikes me the crisis uh, affecting America and the UK at the moment, which is this, this true, false, post-truth uh, crisis, um, is really a crisis of us trying to reach for a new workable consensus. Now, in my view, what's happened is um, iniquitous men like Nigel Farage have pretended that the old consensus will do again. So they've reached back into 1930 and said, let's just do what we did before postmodernism and say the white male uh, imperialist narrative is the right one. Go away, foreigners. Let's build up male chauvinist power again and let's reach for that. And in a way, because the many people have been afraid and destabilized by the effects of radical postmodernism, you can see why that message is attractive. But actually, of course, it's the wrong way forward because we can't forget all the things poor postmodernism has taught us any more than we can forget how to make nuclear weapons. We are in a post-postmodern world, whether we like it or not. So a 1930s solution just ain't going to do. So what we have to do is we have to find a new way, I think, to reach out across all the different relativist discourses and say, look, what is the thing that we can all agree on? Where do we build our communal platform? And it seems to me that that work is good work. And it needs to reach beyond um, race, beyond religion, um, and beyond even the science and non-science debate to a position where, if nothing else, we can say, well, we're all interested in the future of humanity, are we not? If we can all agree that, then what follows is we need to um, marshal and model our societies in order to give our children um, a better planet than the one that we inherited. And we almost have to start again, I think. And I think that's what postmodernism has required of us. But I think the optimist in me says, we're starting again in a great new way because we're not starting again in the Donald Trump, Nigel Farage mode of going back to the 1930s. Rather, we're saying, listen, we hear your voices, um, um, Somalis. We hear your voices, North Koreans. We hear your voices, Norwegians. We hear all of these voices and we accept them and we say, that's all true. But nonetheless, we must live together. Let's now agree a new consensus. And I think nothing short of a new consensus is what we need. Otherwise, my fear is we will eradicate our wildlife. We will end up continually at war. We will end up with kind of pure our racism and so on and so on. Um, and I think that that new consensus, which is the best way I can put it, is urgently needed and actually needs to include the very people that we most don't want to talk to. So in my case, um, I really don't want to talk with the Breitbart, Breitbart Farage East people who, who, who have their views, but actually they're the very people that the liberal West should be addressing. And in a sense, there's no point talking to each other because we all kind of agree. So we have to reach out to all these foreign discourses, even the ones that are very, very uncomfortable to us, and try and see what, if any, consensus there is.
Because only by doing that will we move forward into a world where we both respect different discourse, but also can plan for the future in a meaningful way. And that seems to me roughly where we are in human history at the moment. We're at the end of the nation state, essentially. And we're just about reaching for a kind of global consciousness. Well, uh, I'm going to continue on with Ursula because Edward has to go. EdwardDOCX.com is his website. So I want to thank you uh, for participating uh, thus far. And uh, anyone can find uh, more out about Edward at his website. I'll also link to Ursula's as well. But I'll continue on with Ursula in a moment. Listen, I just want to say it was real pleasure talking with you. And I'd love to talk again. That was very, very interesting. Well, let's really definitely. I'll send you an email and we'll, we'll find other occasions to talk. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Really, really fun. If you're in London, look me up for sure. Okay, Thank great. You. Will do. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dan. Also okay. great to talk with you, and I'll, I'll speak okay. again. Okay. Uh, Edward Dox had to leave, but I'm continuing on the conversation about postmodernism with Ursula Heiss. Um, we, you had mentioned uh, science uh, and uh, species and uh, taxonomies, and I, I know, for example, you know, species are supposedly uh, to be defined by... Uh, uh, a lack of interbreeding, but we've seen, for example, that zebras and horses can interbreed, even though they're different species and whatnot. And uh, um, l let me just uh, talk ab about how uh, postmodernism has affected science. Do you think it's had as big an effect or, or more of a, an effect on science than it has on the arts? Well, I mean, there was a big, um, as, as you'll remember, of course, there was the big conflict between um, postmodern informed philosophies and scientists in the late 80s and early 90s, the so-called science wars, where um, scientists were really concerned about um, about the what they saw as the obscurantism that ultimately emerged from the questioning of facts that they saw that they saw as coming from um, you know sociology, anthropology, literary studies um, in the in the late eighties and early nineties, um, and I think. Um, we're not, and you know, it led up to the to the SoCal debate around social text and the question of of um, fake science um, and the way in which um, a certain kind of science could be sold to um, to humanists who, in the view of the scientists, didn't know the first thing about science. Um, I think um, that abated in the in the late in the late nineteen nineties, but the question of and I, I think there's very few people um, now um, on either side who occupy the extreme positions that, that we saw in the late 80s and early 90s. So I think you have very few people who occupy an extreme relativist position um, and argue that there is no reality out there or that we can really know nothing about whatever reality is out there. At the same time, I think scientists, many scientists are are quite conscious of the limits of their own epistemologies and their own methods of of inquiry and you know no, no better example than climate change um i think um you know climate scientists have been very eager to defend their science against the um sort of concerted campaigns of disinformation that have come from the fossil fuel industry at the same time you know you sit down with climate scientists or you listen to when they talk uh, between themselves they're also very conscious of the fact that while they're able to project what the big picture of average temperature development will be, um, our models are their models are not uh, good enough to really predict in a lot of cases what the exact impacts are going to be at the local level. And the local level is what matters for a lot of political um, and mitigation measures. So, um, so I think uh, the radical positions that you saw in the in the nineteen nineties are not very frequently occupied anymore. Um, I don't know that postmodernism has uh, transformed science in the way in which it at one point transformed the humanities and, and the qualitative parts of the social sciences, um, but certainly there is a great deal of, of reflexiveness in the science about the accuracy of modeling and about the accuracy of empirical studies. I mean, there's, there's now... Um, you know, a lot of debate in the scientific community about um, how many uh, results of empirical studies actually cannot be replicated. In some uh, investigations into that, you probably saw this, um, about 30% of empirical 
on scientific studies were actually not able to be replicated by other labs and other people. So that's a basic benchmark um, for accuracy um, and scientific validity that a lot of scientific studies themselves are not able to meet. So there's from not from an all postmodernist point of view, but precisely from a, from a viewpoint of what are facts, what are replicable facts, I think there is a lot more caution on the part of scientists about their own science. Well, I want to work my way back to the arts and postmodernism, but I want to use science as an example. And uh, one of the things that uh, in art is always defined as one of the hallmarks of art, I disagree with it, but most people would talk about art and beauty and whatnot. And when we talk about beauty and science, uh, at least when it refers to sexual attraction, you know, we talk about symmetry. Uh, there's the, the, the hourglass figure for the woman, the, the V-shape for the male as, you know, the ideal physique or, or, or whatnot. Um, and, you know, most people, and I, I've read many studies, for example, when you've gotten babies of all colors and only a few weeks old, long before they can be culturally, uh, culturally, uh, you know, uh, acclimated, uh, they will look at, say, a very symmetrical, beautiful African woman or a Chinese woman, or uh, and this could be either sex or uh, Caucasian or anything, uh, and and they'll be attracted to that. They'll they'll look and they'll get a smile on their face. Whereas if you put, let's say, an old leper's face or an old man with a lot of warts on his face, people are gonna. Uh, even these babies will shy away from that. Uh, and I think I think there's a difference between sexual attraction versus beauty. Uh, beauty seems to be scientifically uh, proven as uh, something that's objective that most human beings can agree upon, whereas sexual attraction, you know, I can be attracted to someone who's a wallflower or, or something. Um, so let me just talk uh, just about that, and then I will relate it back to the arts. Do you accept, for example, that there are objective uh, realities, say, uh, in science, uh, related to things that most people think are aesthetic, like beauty? No, I don't. I mean, with beauty in particular, I mean, I would just point out that, that beauty standards, for example, with regard to the female body, so far from the V-shape being the ideal, there's actually a lot of cultures that... Uh, well, that I mean, the V-shape for the male... What, what, uh, sorry, the, the hourglass shape. Um, there's actually a lot of cultures where where women who would be considered um, overweight in Western culture are considered the most beautiful. Um, so I would want to see those studies. I mean, beauty is one of those things that is culturally um, actually quite different and is historically different, where in our own history, we didn't always consider the same things beautiful that we consider beautiful now. So I think we need to distinguish between things that are, and, and there's the, the, the an important distinction, I think, between things that are biologically anchored and things that are anchored by long historical traditions. Um, so I'd be very, very cautious about um, about walking um, aesthetic concepts back um, to science. I mean, I think it's interesting to do, but I think you want to be very cautious about it and um, and um, uh, be very sure that you that you that you do your studies the right way and with the with the appropriate number of different subjects. Well, let me let me refer it back to film. Let me give you a, an example. Uh, oftentimes, when people will, will say, "Well, they'll they'll mix up the idea that they're liking a film with it being good." Let me give you an example from uh, 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 late fifties, uh, early sixties. Uh, I'm I'm sure you've probably seen two thousand and one by Kubrick, or you can name any uh, you know uh, any claimed great film by Fellini or Bergman or whatnot. And then I don't know if you've ever watched it, but you know a film like say Plan Nine from Outer Space, which is considered a schlock yeah. uh, a film. Now, right. no one, no one would, in their right mind, say that Ed Wood was on a par with a Bergman or a Kubrick or an Orson Welles as a filmmaker. So we, so when people talk about everything's relative, I, I say, well, people say that until they get to their own opinions. For example, you know, as I said, no one in their right mind could could say that Plan Nine from Outer Space is up there with Two Thousand and One or any other you know, masterful film. Uh, so do you think that uh, when people are referring to things of how do you judge, they're really talking about the minutia, the difference between two great films or two pieces of garbage, a Michael Bay film versus, uh, you know, some other, uh, what is the, uh, the, the car films, you know, they've got these franchises that have 20... 
Yeah, that that have twenty one episodes of one, and it's the but same. You don't film. like to watch a good fight between robots. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy that myself. <laughs> yeah, but you can, you can enjoy that, and, and I certainly have uh, guilty pleasures. But you have to recognize them as guilty pleasures, and that's one of the things that I think when we deal with postmodernism, uh, we don't get. Like I said, you use the term unreadable, whereas I translate that as being bad in refer in reference to Wallace. Yeah, I think that's that's where we do have a difference of opinion, where I think actually a postmodernism um, through a different strain of sociology in this case, and Pierre Bourdieu's work in particular, um, has shown that, again, you know, what you call up there, um, you know, that sort of uh, that sort of distinction between what's a masterwork and what's a piece of schlock, um, the way in which um, that itself is, of course, uh, you know, informed by a certain history of taste that Bourdieu, I think, has been very astute about pointing out that what you and I consider masterworks and what what um, uh, and what we consider guilty pleasures, which is an interesting thing that we actually find things pleasurable that we aesthetic by some aesthetic criteria might consider inferior um, is actually shaped by a long history of taste. This is not something that comes to us naturally. This is what we what we learn from the start in particular in our particular cultural community, what our parents um, uh, told us was good, what our what our what our um, what our uh, teachers, you know, in, instructed us was worthwhile watching and, and what was not. And I think one thing that postmodernism has done is um, not necessarily to say that there are no no hierarchies of value. I think that was maybe a little bit the mistake in the late 80s and early 90s when um, cultural studies practitioners in particular went ahead and said, oh, there really is no difference of value. Um, I don't think that's actually the point. The point is to ask, what is at stake in making these value distinctions? Um, so when you say Plan 9 from Outer Space is crap in 2001, is a masterpiece. Why are you saying that? What's the purpose of that argument? What are you trying to convince your listener of? And I think that's something that's really important to keep in mind. I mean, who's in what cultural and social context are these claims made, and whose interests are they meant to promote, and whom whom are they are whom are they supposed to dismiss? Right. I mean, I think that's something that postmodernism was actually good at foregrounding. Again, I'm not in agreement with those extremes, and I think few people these days are. Um, who in the in the 1980s said, "Oh, there's no distinction between you know then Madonna and Beethoven." Now, there's all kinds of differences. The question is, um, what are the, how do these differences mean to different people? I mean, that to me, as a scholar of literature and art and culture, is what the really interesting thing is. How do these differences mean to different people, and why? Well, that's that's an interesting point, but I think that one of the things is that I think most postmodernism does not do that. It doesn't ask the questions. It sort of throws things out. And a lot of times you get the idea that, for example, art is somehow exceptional to other human endeavors. I'll give you an example from architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright. He's generally recognized aesthetically as making beautiful homes, but most architects, if you ask him, his homes were very poorly built structurally. And so you, uh -huh. so you have, you have, for example, his most famous uh, small work uh, building is probably the, the famous Falling Waters uh, home. Uh, and, right. and that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I saw a documentary where the three or four last owners complained about many structural defects that they had to pour a lot of money into rebuilding. Now, one could argue, say, well, the architecture isn't necessarily an art, and I would tend to agree with that. It has some features of art, but it also serves a, a purpose in that it's, it's a domicile, it's a dwelling to prevent the people from getting wet when it rains, etc. Whereas, uh, you know, an artwork isn't going to do that. The image of Guernica, for example, isn't going to protect you uh, if it's a tornado is coming your way. Um, but uh, still, uh, it seems to me that a lot of postmodern, especially postmodern critics, try to make art exceptional in that it's outside of human endeavors that 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 uh, cannot be explained by for example the use uh, if you talk about say writing uh, or even any art use of clichés uh if we're talking about films the use of camera movement and what 
uh, or, or the way we, uh, you know, a character is having a moment and we're going to go very close up on their face is considered a, a trite camera move because we know this is an important moment. We don't need the camera to establish that for us. So do you think that, say, for example, postmodern criticism has been guilty of overlooking these things? You know, I would actually, so there's, I think, two different parts to your question. One is the question of whether art is different from other human endeavors. And the other question I'm hearing is, um, to what extent is art and is human endeavor in general sort of assimilable to biological principles and evolutionary principles? And I think I think those are two somewhat different questions. I mean, the, the first question has postmodern lit and art criticism considered art apart from other endeavors i would pretty resoundingly say no and i'm curious that you would think that it has done that i'm wondering who what critics you're thinking of because to me sort of the some of the roots of of postmodern art criticism would be something like Roland Barthes' mythologie, right, mythologies from 1959, where very deliberately he actually puts um, works of art um, next to recipes for making particular kinds of dishes in um, in popular magazines, where he looks at um, the description of a cruise among royals in the popular press and the myths that are, that, that there are attached to that alongside photography and and film so um and i think the the whole tradition of cultural studies as it was practiced sort of between the 1980s and the mid 1990s was actually set out to question traditional distinctions between art and and um more vernacular um, things like gardening, like um, carpentering, and so forth. And in part, that was done um, by people who worked on 18th century and Renaissance culture and who said, well, you know, um, I mean, really, before Romanticism, um, uh, carpentering and gardening and um, making pastries were not considered so different from poetry. They were all skills of making. Um, and, and people were considered craftspeople in these different areas. And the idea that, that art is something that should be considered by completely different criteria and that comes from something very different that from the romantic age onwards we call sort of inspiration or that we consider the special condition of the artist and the poet is really a fairly recent historical invention. So I think there is a strand of postmodern literature and art criticism that precisely tries to question um, these kinds of these kinds of distinctions. The other question I think that you bring up, so um, and I, I don't know if I understood you correctly there, Dan, but did you mean sort of is is um, you know is our dam building different from Beaver Dam building and is Frank Lloyd Wright different from what bees do in build, building their beehive? Are there are there comparable criteria? Was that what you were asking about? The extent to which a scientific perspective might illuminate some of these human crafts? Well, well it could be. I was going more for the idea that uh, a lot of times uh, uh, we look at things uh, because because art generally, uh, as I said, you can't take uh, the image or the mental image of of Picasso's Guernica and, and use it to shield you from uh, rain falling over your head. But architecture serves not only an aesthetic purpose, say if it's a beautiful building, uh, but it also serves a functional purpose, whereas most art in a sense isn't functional. And that's, I think, one of the powers is that you can go your whole life without reading a poem and you can live and you can defecate and you can, you can reproduce and whatnot, but that poem will add something but you need a shelter, for example. No, this is this is true, and certainly art is different from other kinds of crafts in that respect. Although, you know, as a as somebody who's really interested in in analysis and theory of narrative, um, a really interesting question there is: so why do we then read novels at all, or why do we read poems? Why do we sometimes pay considerable sums of money to go see Picasso's Guernica? Um, so what what does it what does it do for us? And um, certainly. Certainly the utility is much more indirect, but you could argue that there is nevertheless something about um, uh, about Picasso's painting that allows us to deal 
with the reality of violence, of war, of atrocity on a large scale, that clearly must have some utility for us or else, you know, we wouldn't be doing it and we wouldn't go out of our way to do this. And so in terms of uh, storytelling in particular, I'm less of an expert on um, the origins of, of pictorial art, but so there's a very interesting sort of biological and cognitive science um, debate about the yeah. origins of storytelling. How did we ever come up with narrative? When yeah. was that a skill that became functional um, to the point where it then could be passed down from generation to generation and became an established part of culture in a very, very wide variety of concrete manifestations. Yeah, well, uh, the, the difference, I think, is that in art, when we're talking about benefit, where we get to the area of qualia in that uh, if we have a well-built home that can withstand a, a thunderstorm, we're both going to stay dry. Whereas if we watch the same movie, uh, you may find it to be sweet and be drawn to it uh, for totally different reasons than I am. And there's no way that, for example, if you think uh, a Nicole Kidman heroine uh, is is brave and whatnot, and I'm drawn to the film because of its cinematography, uh, I can explain to you why it's great because of its cinematography. You can say to me, well, the movie is carried on, on the actress's back, so to speak. Uh, but how we how we affected we're never going to know precisely why, but we can both know that that good building is keeping us dry. Uh, oh, absolutely. No, and I, I don't disagree with with some basic distinctions like that. At the same time, I think when you come at this sort of as a researcher, um, it is always an interesting question. So what are the uses of art for us? Or what are the uses of certain cultural practices that, as you point out, don't fulfill immediate survival needs um, in the sense that uh, that a shelter over our, our heads or um, a rainproof coat does. Um, and, and this is a very, that is a very interesting question. Why, for example, do all of us go out and take hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of photos on our vacation trips that most of us um, hardly ever look at again? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most of these uh, most of these photos used to end up in boxes full of paper prints. Now they end up in on our computers as endless endless image files. And the question is, we neither us nor our friends end up looking at the overwhelming majority of these photos ever again. Yet we keep taking them. And so the question is. Um, what is it, what use is fulfilled in the act of making these pictures? What kind of grasp of reality at the moment that we're seeing a certain natural spectacle? I've been interested in this in particular with people's nature photography. I mean, we're all obsessed with, with photographing beautiful landscapes and charismatic animals. What function does that fulfill? What sense of control or perhaps memory, a desire to hold on to something that we feel might be evanescent, does this give us, quite regardless of the fact of whether we'll ever um, get to look at those pictures again or whether we'll post, uh, you know, post them on Facebook or Instagram so that others can, can um, look at them. And I would ask the same question with regard to narrative. I mean, you're quite right that most forms of narrative that we now practice, and specifically you know, acts such as the ones that we're thinking of, like reading short stories, um, watching a TV series, reading a novel, watching a film, don't fulfill any immediate existential needs. But when you go back um, in evolutionary history, the question is, well, did narratives actually at some point fulfill some kind of a survival need in the sense that um, the other members of our um, Pleistocene tribe could convey to us um, via narrative, what you should do in case you encounter a grizzly bear or a lion, right? Um, or what you do um, when you're caught in a thunderstorm that actually did have a concrete survival value. All of this is, I should say, as science quite speculative, since we don't have any records of what early storytelling was like, except the occasional um, rock paintings, but we don't have any recordings of what original storytelling was like. So, so we have to speculate, but, um, but evolutionary scientists and cognitive scientists have tried to think about why it is that something like storytelling, which is a cultural universal, I mean, all cultures have some form of storytelling, why did that 
that arise? What was its utility? Um, and is that the right way to, to look at it? I'll, I'll also add in um, another dimension of this, though, and this is, a, to me, a particularly interesting one. Um, one of the more recent developments in the multiple posts that our culture has engaged in, I mean, one of the things that that has taken on a lot of um, importance over the last, I'd say, 20 years is various forms of post-humanism. Post-humanism is related to post-modernism, but it's not exactly the same thing, just as post-structuralism was related to post-modern literature and art, but wasn't exactly arguably the same thing. Um, so post-humanisms come in a, in a huge variety of philosophical arguments and, and artistic forms, and it's really hard to generalize about them, but one thing that they do share in common is a questioning of the centrality of the human subject, individual and collective, and of our exceptionality. That is the idea that we are fundamentally different from other organisms, specifically, of course, you know, other kinds of highly evolved mammals. Um, and that's where the question of art has come back in, in a very interesting way. I mean, there are now um, scientists who um, themselves ask not so much whether um, our art is different from the kinds of endeavors that other animals undertake and whether our practical crafts are different from our arts, um, but whether other non-human species actually also possess a sense of aesthetics that's not sufficiently explained by um, evolutionary adaptation and by, um, by sheer utility. So I'm a passionate bird watcher and bird keeper. And so one area that has particularly caught my attention and, and fascinated me is the way in which bird song is being revisited under that under that heading. So, you know, most of the 10,000 bird species that science has so far identified are able to do their basic reproductive mating, bringing up young business on the basis of about half a dozen calls and songs, you know, mating calls, alert calls, calls of the young for the parents to feed them and so on. But you also have a considerable number of bird species. Um, take one very ordinary example, um, uh, starlings. Um, mockingbirds, and then um, certain exotic bird species that David Attenborough has investigated in great depth that have dozens or even hundreds of different calls and songs, all of which they use in mating and they use in other, in other um, uh, practical endeavors. But the question is, why couldn't they just have a simple mating call or mating dance just like everybody else in the avian world does? And that's where, um, where, and where they um, sometimes elaborately imitate the calls of other birds, which you know you think was counterproductive for in, from any practical um, point of view. And so the question of whether there's actually aesthetic enjoyment at stake here and whether um, the bower birds who build um, elaborate mosaics of certain colors and certain objects for their mates and where the females then come and inspect the bowers of different males and seem to judge them much the way art critics do and pick the, the one with the most complex um, with the most complex arrays and the ones that are that are um, best arrayed in, in terms of color. It's really hard to line that up with any traditional sort of basic reductive evolutionary explanation of saying, oh, this is so they can so they can successfully mate. That's at some basic level obviously true, but the question is why do they need such an elaborate aesthetic ritual for this when uh, you know hundreds of other bird species are able to do with much simpler mechanisms? So the question of whether non-human species actually have a sense of aesthetics has come back in as a serious scientific question in the way that that it, it didn't before the last 25 years and i think anybody who's lived with animals knows that they're just knows intuitively what science is now getting onto, which is that of course um there are senses of pleasure of joy and maybe of aesthetic enjoyments among cats and birds and dogs and other species that we live with that are they're not reducible and they're not as different from us as as we think they are so i think one of the most interesting things that has come out of looking at 
biology and evolution on one hand and as and art and aesthetics on the other hand um, over the last 25 years actually has been under the sign of a certain type of post-humanism to actually say well we may not be the only ones who have a sense of aesthetics there may be other species that have it too and it may take very different forms some of us some of them are re readily recognizable for us um, you know the visual and oral types of aesthetics might be very very recognizable to us then there might be other types of olfactory and tactile aesthetics that are not readily recognizable to us but might be very obvious to an ant or even to a dog well let's uh, end there in the final segment i just want to talk about uh, criticism uh, again and uh, your own personal ideas about it and we'll do that when we return Going to wrap up my conversation uh, on postmodernism, uh, I had uh, Edward Dox earlier, uh, finishing up with Ursula Heiss. Uh, we left off talking about aesthetics, and I wanted to just, before I, I give you some final closing remarks, as I did Edward, uh, I wanted to sort of hone in on not only uh, criticism, but your personal uh, approach to criticism uh, as vis-a-vis -vis, uh, POMO. Um, I think... Uh, I, I am always wary of aesthetics because aesthetics to me are sort of like, uh, you know, tasting on a tongue. What What's bitter to me may be uh, a bit sweeter to you. Uh, and I always... Do you I, feel what I feel kind of Yeah, well, the, yes. the qualia thing that I had mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, but uh, I want to give an example. Earlier I talked about the USA and uh, New York trilogies. Uh, and I want to give a final example, uh, give my opinion on it, and then ask how you would approach it. Uh, oftentimes when I'm talking about postmodernism, the name that comes up, and probably the biggest name here in America is Thomas Pynchon. And probably his most celebrated book uh, is Gravity's Rainbow. And I've often said to many people that if you want to read an actual good version of Gravity's <coughs> Rainbow, read Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, because it's one-fifth the length and has about 10 times the poesy and, and art in it. Um, and the reason I say so is because uh, when I look at uh, Gravity's Rainbow, there's no real characterization. There are pages and pages, as with Wallace, of just cliches upon cliches, not only naked cliches in terms of the phraseology, but uh, character tropes and whatnot, and nothing is done with that. Uh, whereas when I look at Vonnegut's book, uh, I, I can see v very much the same strands. And both books concern World War II. They have seemingly outrageous uh, plot points that can both can be argued as science fiction books. Uh, but Vonnegut does it in a, a very pithy, dry style. Slaughterhouse-Five, I think, is, is his best work. Um, yet Vonnegut is very rarely called, sometimes called, but very rarely called a postmodernist. He's sometimes uh, been labeled just as a science fiction writer turned, uh, you know, he's, they've sort of tried to ghettoize him, whereas Pinchon has been lauded and lauded. Uh, and I, I could go on with, with why I think uh, the two works, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, is far superior, but how would you approach, uh, say, two similar works like that, or the USA Austin trilogies, and determine, uh, either in a postmodern way or even just in a, a purely critical way, disregarding isms, uh, that one work is superior to another, especially if they have similar aims and 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 uh, themes. So you're putting me in a very difficult position since Slaughterhouse Fife and and um and Gravity's Rainbow are both books that I really love. Um, I think they're they're actually both um, amazing novels. But you're right that they try to do very different things. And one of the first things I would say is that Slaughterhouse Five um, deploys some of the strategies of science fiction, um, the futuristic motif of being captured by aliens, um, as a way of thinking about the historical trauma of the firebombing of Dresden, and just in general, the experience of, of World War II. I think you're quite right that a lot of books by Kurt Vonnegut, um, not just Slaughterhouse-Five, also something like Breakfast of Champions, I think does by rights belong into the postmodernist canyon in the sense that it does to, it, it establishes a certain narrative world for us and then builds in a lot of mechanisms that actually um, destabilize and question that world for us in its, in its fictional reality. Um, Gravity's Rainbow, 
is a book that um, I I think is is very good, um, but it tries to do something very different. It is set in the after aftermath of World War II, but I don't think it is actually about World War II and the way in which um, the zone, the German uh, post-war zone, is described in the novel, and that's often been pointed out in the criticism um, on the novel. Uh, actually, draws on a lot of the tropes of the 1960s. I mean, the way in which a character such as Zora Buma in the ruins of Berlin is peddling drugs, right? Like a 1960s counterculture guru, um, uh, is uh, clearly has nothing to do with the reality of post World War II Berlin. The way in which the main character Tyrone Slothrop turns from a more or less um, realistically conceived GI into a character who's deliberately modeled on um, graphic novels, on comic books, when he becomes Rocket Man, then turns into a mythological German pig hero, and finally just becomes a figure in the landscape. He becomes a road intersection at his final narrative dissolution. Um, all of these are mechanisms whereby Pynchon, I think, very deliberately sets up a certain kind of narrative genre and pattern for us. So the first two parts of the novel clearly belong into the genre of um, the, um, the spy novel. Um, so Tyrone Slothop sets out as a spy or as a counterintelligence agent and, um, and some of the devices of the detective novel where he goes out to, um, to determine the mystery of his own origins and his strange sexual reaction to um, to the bombs in during the London Blitz. So there's these two narrative templates which are very clearly set out and stuck by in the first two parts of the novel, only then to disintegrate in the last parts, last few sections of the novel. And I think what's at stage at, st at stake in that particular narrative experiment at the disintegration of certain plot lines and the very deliberately staged disintegration of anything that you could conceive of as character is not World War II. In the end, what P Thomas Pynchon is after is American history and the turns it took. I mean, there's lots of allusions to Puritanism and the way in which a certain kind of religious philosophy, Calvinism, Puritanism, shaped American history. There's a very deliberate revisiting of certain turning points in American history and a reflection on how American culture and society might have come out differently if it had taken a different turn. So I don't think that's in the end a novel about World War II in the way Slaughterhouse-Five is at all. I think World War II and the sort of the indeterminacy, the confusions, the disorientations of the post-war post -war German zone are a metaphor for thinking about American history very specifically and about what um, the United States has become in the aftermath of World War II, but also going back a lot further um, in history. Um, and um, okay. and um, whereas in, in, um, in Vonnegut, I think the primary subject of the novel is World War II. So I would be very hesitant to say that one is a better novel than the other. I think they're both actually really good novels at what they do, but they use different genres and they use them, I think, with very different objectives. And, you know, when I teach these novels, when I teach um, postmodern novels, you were asking us, what, what are the criteria for saying that one is superior to the other? I should say that to me, that isn't actually the primary objective. Um, when I teach fiction, whether it's postmodern fiction, whether it's environmental literature or anything else, what I try to teach my students is to say, okay, what um, established narrative templates are at work here, and how does this particular author um, innovate on them, change them, put them in a new context, add something completely new, or in what cases and by what means does a particular author actually tell a story that's completely different from what has gone before. So when I teach environmental literature, um, I teach a class that's called Environment and Narrative, where I teach novels, but I also teach film, and I teach nonfiction. Um, and what I want the students to walk out of the class with is an understanding of how um, the genre of pastoral, the celebration of the countryside as an antithesis to the urban landscape has shaped our understanding of nature. And by our, I mean both 
Western European and North American understanding of nature for the last 2000 years in different forms in Virgil, in Renaissance pastoral, and then in the particular forms that this has taken in American literature, um, in the Western, um, and then in a particular kind of environmental literature, um, and how um, recent environmental literature, in some sense, and some sometimes very unoriginally, builds on that narrative template, and then in other cases, um, really defamiliarizes it. Um, so take a book like Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, um, book from 1975 that won a Pulitzer Prize. It's nonfiction, um, and it's nature writing, but it's nature writing of a very strange and unusual kind that actually does not celebrate um, the, the idol of the countryside um, in any kind of predictable way. Um, she describes a scene at the very beginning of the book where she walks by a pond and she sees a frog and then sees the flesh of the frog being pulled out of its out of its skin by a predator and then only sees the skin of the frog. It's a very eerie and in some sense very violent scene that's described in very lyrical terms. Another narrative template that um, I teach my students in these classes is apocalyptic narrative, how secular apocalypse, um, which has a deep tradition in American literature and culture, um, has shaped our thinking about environmental disaster, about even things like climate change in a very, in a very profound way, and how our understanding of scientific realities, and that's maybe where the postmodern twist comes in, cannot in the end be disentangled from our into intuitive and hopefully after the class much more conscious understanding of certain narrative patterns. Um, and the same would be true of postmodern narrative, and I've taught classes on postmodern literature, culture, postmodern theory many times, and I usually start out with architecture and often with a building that Ed mentioned a while ago with um, Philip Johnson's AT&T building um, to show how in architecture postmodernism meant the turn from away from the international style um, to more vernacular um, and more playful kinds of deployments of historical style, so what Frederick Jameson famously called pastiche. So the use of historical styles without any deeper intent than, than just play. And so I want students in those classes to walk away with a sense of what are the different types of experimentation that have become associated with postmodernism, what holds them together, what tells them apart. And then I think the way I would judge quality uh, is in some sense in a very romantically inflected way as what's original about this, in what way does a particular text or a particular work of art just deploy things that, say, by the 1980s, by the time we had 20 years of postmodern art, had themselves become more or less cliches and established patterns, and in what way does it do something, something innovative? And there well, too, I probably would want to defend Thomas Pynchon a little bit against your criticism that Gravity's Rainbow is full of cliches. I don't actually think so. A screaming came across the sky. I think that's a very startling um, start for a novel. Um, it's a startling beginning for a novel about a war. And it's even more startling once you begin to realize that actually that particular mob drop that is described at the beginning of the novel is actually not reality. It only occurs in the dream of Pirate Prentice, one of the major characters in the novel. Well, right? So it, there's all kinds of surprises and layers. So Gravity's Rainbow, to me, does not seem cliched at all. But it, it, that's a, you're talking like a 330,000 word novel. And I'm not, I'm not saying that there's... Uh, there aren't some good moments here or there. Um, but for example, if you read uh, Proust, his whole uh, 1.25 million word seven book, uh, Remembrance of Things Past or In Search of Lost Time, I've often said, uh, you know, there's 300,000 words that are brilliant and uh, uh, the, the rest of it, or 300 pages that are brilliant and another 3,000 pages that are a slog. So, I mean, you can always, put, you know, I, I, in the worst film, for example, just to use a, a very obvious thing, even in a Michael Bay film, you can find a moment, say, uh, of, of brilliant cinematography, or even maybe some rare moment where the actors convince you that you're in that moment. Um, 
but I wanted to I wanted to talk a, a little bit about uh, and I want to. I guess what I'm interested in though, Dan, to ask you a counter yeah. question is there. Why are you so obsessed with with classifying certain things as masterpieces and other pieces as slog? Why is that so important? Because that that that. That's how that's how we live through life. We we make we make judgments of of this is good, this is bad. Am I going to go to the left down that dark alley, or am I going to go here? And when we and when we and when we read, well, you ask. Uh, you know, it's the same thing. Why someone should eat a salad rather than junk food? Because if if you if you consume our junk food, your mind is going to go mush just the way your your waste is going to get bloated if you're well, eating unless, McDonald's. Unless you have a really good teacher who actually shows you what might be interesting about some of that junk food. So I'm somebody who also teaches regular lectures on science fiction. And science fiction, you know, like all genres, produces um, any amount of novels that I would call, and films, that I would call not interesting, and then produces a very large number of artworks that I think are really, really interesting, although I maybe wouldn't, by my personal standards, call all of them good. But I think what, what to me, is much more interesting is to look at what does what does what do individual arts of works of art do with our understanding of particular situations and with science fiction, of course, you know the way in which um, certain science fiction films imagine future cities, the way in which they imagine the future of climate, um, the way in which they use the classical science fiction motif of the presence of aliens among, among us. Um, do they do something new with it, or do they just rehash things that we've seen a million times before? Well, you can have um, new that's, stuff so that's, that's bad, that's, and you can have rehash like, stuff that's great. I mean, th again, this is a this is a separate th the good bad. And I've often said people often fall into these things. The good bad axis of of, of assessment is totally different than than new or original, because or something that can be original can be utter crap. I mean, I, if you ever well, look it's at... it's also different from what, to me, really is the more interesting question. I mean, I'm just not that interested in the question of what is good or bad anymore. I feel like that was something that, that I did when I was an undergraduate, but even when when I got to grad school, that sort of had, had a feel of... Um, you know, of, of differently shaped tastes to it that well, in the let, end was just going to be sort of, do you feel what I feel? Let, to me, let me the just more follow interesting up on question that. is, I may not like Star Wars, but why is it so popular? What is it that makes that particular series of films so attractive? So in other words, what... But that's more you, sociological than artistic question, is it not? Star Wars' is, Star Wars is impact is more sociological than artistic. No, I think those are those are impossible to disentangle because the reasons why individual people go um, may be artistic or aesthetic ones, but then collectively what work it does for individuals and for collectives um, emerges from these individual reactions. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think to, to me those are very, very closely associated to the point where it's really very, very, very hard to tell the difference between them. Yeah. So that's the real question is like what cultural work and whether you want to call that work um, uh, social, cultural, or aesthetic to me are, are nuances, but what work does it actually do? That's the really interesting research question to answer. Well, then I, then I would ask, then how, how does a, a canon or how does a, a syllabus of things to be taught get selected? For example, I've talked to many uh, women uh, who are interested in, say, feminists, and we're getting away from postmodernism, but I'll use this as an example to get back to postmodernism. If we're talking about feminist writing, why is someone like Jane Austen, for example, in her novels, which to me are a little better than the Bronte sisters decades later, uh, held up in such high regard? And when a verse novel like Aurora Lee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, that's not only uh, a poem in a novel form, which is unique, most, most of the lady writers then wrote, you know, dense, silly romances. This is, this is a feminist book. It's also got a great story. It's got a, a lead protagonist. And it's leagues beyond anything, not only that Austin achieved, but that Austin could even think of doing. And if we're talking about using verse to talk about reality, since poetry is, you know, obviously a fiction, we don't live poetic lives. You could even make an argument that she was doing something along the lines of what Stern did in Tristram Shandy. Uh -huh. uh, but yet I have met feminist uh, professors like yourself. Who, who Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Sonnets to the Portuguese. She wrote. She wrote Aurora Lee. They don't even know this. So how does Aurora Lee get left left out of a canon where someone like Austin is becomes a demigod? 
Well, I think in constructing syllabi, what you what you do as a teacher is you, I mean, a lot of this is determined, obviously, by what the learning goals of the class are. What is it that you want the students to walk out of the class with? And what are, what are the kinds of texts that lend themselves most to them acquiring that kind of, that, those kinds of skills and knowledge? Um, and you combine that with an assessment of um, of what is it that is manageable for students at a certain level. So I wouldn't typically teach gravity's rainbow to lower division undergraduates, whereas I very readily taught it to graduate students. And, you know, if you like me teach in a quarter system, you're also constrained simply by the length of certain texts, like what is readable for students realistically in 10 weeks, you know, where they have to, they have the same number of classes as students on a semester system do, but a third less time to read. Um, how do you manage at public universities like UCLA, or I have a lot of good friends at the University of Wisconsin, how do you manage teaching long, complex novels with the reality that a lot of the students work at least 20 hours a week to make their way through school? So I think um, syllabi, the particular canon represented by syllabi, are a complex arithmetic of those different um, of those different um, variables. What is it that you want the students to learn? What are texts that you consider absolutely indispensable for them to get to know in that context? And what it is what is it reasonable to expect them to be able to take in, given the time constraints and given their level of incoming skill and knowledge at the level that you're teaching. So I think I think syllabi are a very specific outcome of that. And I don't have any idea why I don't teach 19th century literature. So I don't know um, what the parameters would be that would go into choosing um, Jane Austen over Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. My hunch would be um, that since Jane Austen has had um, an afterlife in contemporary literature and culture, um, and particularly in contemporary film, that um, 19th century literature teachers might feel that Jane Austen is um, more easily to bridge with students' lived reality than Elizabeth Barrett Browning is, who arguably has not had the same kind of resonance in contemporary popular culture. But that's just a hunch on my part. I honestly, I have not um, asked that particular question of anybody who teaches 19th century okay. literature, so I wouldn't be able to answer in terms of those two specific authors. Well, let me let me just bring it to the uh, closer to the modern then, and uh, then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, uh, it was earlier pointed out about uh, different ethnicities and whatnot, and I was thinking of, a, of what's considered a postmodern novel written by a black writer, Ishmael Reed, like Mumbo Jumbo, and uh -huh. and there's a lot of uh, uh, use of quote unquote black dialect language. And I recently uh, uh, read Zora Neale Hurston's uh, "The Eyes Are Watching God," and uh, sometimes uh, when I read a, a lot of that kind of language, uh, in both cases, I don't think either writer is aware. Uh, of you know, when we hear "gwine," I, I've never heard, for example, any black person, even with a southern dialect, say "gwine" instead of "going." Uh, but uh, putting that aside, uh, in Herson's book, for example, uh, when she's not writing in black dialect, you you get some uh, some beautiful poetic passages about the the, the land that uh, she's in the in the South. When you look at, for example, uh, Reed's uh, book and he his is more urban slang and but it, it still i think has very much a uh when i read it i go oh god uh, if a white writer wrote like like that i mean it, it it would not fly but uh in the rest of his book it's just it's just sentences here or there sometimes whole sentences as paragraphs and there's there's none of the sense of the quality that's uh, in the rest of the book uh, that Hurston has, and yet Hurston's book, uh, I don't think it's a, a great success, but it, it's to me clearly a better work than uh, uh, Reed's book because of, of of the backgrounding she gives the character, so that when they do speak in the, these sort of 1930s little rascals kind of uh, you know butterfly McQueen type speak, you can at least say. Okay, I can get through this. I'm going to get to a, a good description of a hill or something uh, that that that's going to redeem this. When you but you don't get that a lot of time in postmodern. You get this what I call gimmick art. You get just this throwing up of things. Oh, I'm going to use some black language here. I'm going to throw in a reference to Shaft or whatnot. Uh, 
how, how do you, for example, deal with ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic writing, if you will, uh, and whether you, you, you think it works or not, if, since you don't want to use the good or bad axis? Um, so I think, yeah, uh, Mumbo Jumbo is actually a great example, and I, I have often taught that actually together with Gravity's Rainbow, because I think where the two novels compare is in their, um, is that they use some of these um, uh, postmodern disintegrations of typical narrative structure so as to reflect on history, right? Um, and so in, in uh Pynchon, as I mentioned earlier, there is a whole, I think, um, really sophisticated and nuanced um, revisiting of American history that takes place through um, a plot that is deployed in the German zone after World War II. In Ishmael Reed, um, you're in New York in the jazz age, so he casts us back from the early 1970s, and the, the novel came out uh, um, about the same time as, as Gravity's Rainbow, um, but then uses um, the jazz explosion of the 1920s to take us back on a wild and often very funny, very satirical ride through history that takes us back to the Middle Ages and the Knights Templar, to ancient Greece, and ultimately to ancient Egypt, and the religious myths of, of ancient Egypt, so as to outline a totally undifferent understanding of what's normally understood to be Western history, right, and all this tracing back um, to, to Greece, um, less so to Egypt, to actually outline an alternative black history. Um, and that is the point here of the of the narrative disintegration and the juxtapositions, the um, uses of photography and even of bibliography in this. Um, there's a, you know, Ishmael Reed is clearly just having a good deal of fun with the writing of history, with historical scholarship, as well as with the conventions of the historical novel. But there is a point behind it all, which is to say um, that once you dismantle um, what postmodernists used to love to call the master narratives of Western culture, you might catch glimpses of different kinds of continuities, different kinds of histories. I mean, that is sort of what we talked about with Ed in the first part of our conversation here. It is um, it, it is the objective of postmodernism to make alternative histories heard, to tell alternative stories, make alternative voices heard that we haven't perceived before. And one of the main strategies um, narratively speaking, that a lot of these novels use is the fracturing of narrative templates and narrative categories as we know them. So in, in Mumbo Jumbo 2, you have a detective story, you have the story of a museum heist, you have the story of the Crusades. Um, and I think those to me are the, are the, the those are the crucial sort of um, narrative building blocks of that novel. Um, as for the use of um, different forms of speech and different forms of dialect. I mean, that's a, it's a really fascinating issue because um, there's a, uh, I mean, there's, there's many books been written that it's a really fascinating issue of how spoken language gets translated into fiction, right? Um, I mean, for example, Ernest Hemingway is often credited with having some of the some of the crispest and most lifelike dialogues. If you've ever worked in linguistics, as I have, and you looked at, at literal transcripts of actual conversations, you immediately realize that Hemingway's dialogues are nothing like an actual dialogue, which is, um, which is characterized by fractured syntax, by repetitions, by um, by ums and ahs that are constantly interjected um, and so forth. So writers have always had, um, and there's always been a tradition of writers who've um, declared it to be their intent to bring real spoken language into the written text. And they've done this in various ways, and that's as true of Wordsworth, who wanted to introduce the language of the common man as it is of Hemingway, as it is in, in a very different way of Zora Neale Hurston and Ishmael Reed. Um, what they actually have in their texts is, in various ways, a stylization of actual, of actual spoken speech. Um, and um, one particular thing that that comes up um, in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, popular vernacular when it when it um, when it's introduced into fiction is I dialect right um, that you introduce certain written forms that are as you say um, not actually the way um, anything is actually pronounced but that convey 
um, a sense of vernacular, convey a sense of informality. The larger phenomenon that I think you allude to here is um, what Ed, I think, earlier alluded to with a collage aesthetic, or what I would call the pastiche aesthetic of postmodern art and fiction. So um, it's the juxtaposition of different bits of style, either historical styles or different contemporary styles, and those can be visual styles or literary styles, often not with a primarily stylistic intent, but precisely with the intention of juxtapos juxtaposing different styles so as to highlight, and this gets us back to what I think is the closest we can come to an overarching an overarching characterization or goal of postmodernism, which is to foreground for us the construction of reality through, through certain practices of language and through certain practices of narrative. So the introduction of African-American vernacular um, is on one hand an attempt to say, look, um, there's whole realms of spoken language that so far have either not been present in so-called high fiction or high literature or have only been um, present by way of caricature of, of black characters. Think of Uncle Tom's ca Cabin here or, so, or something like that. Um, so there's, a, there, the, there's that sort of realistic intent, but then there's also, and Ishmael read very clearly, the non-realist intent of just saying, okay, um, if you take these different languages and you juxtapose them, what different window on the real and in mumbo jumbo, particularly the, um, the realities as we understand them of Western history, does that, does that open up? Uh, I think that's to me the fascinating thing about the way in which he, he deploys these bits and pieces. Um, and I think that's, um, that's sort of just a, a general hallmark of the way in which style is used in, in postmodernism. And we talked about this earlier with Ed, and I think that's where he was right on with his diagnosis, that now there is a certain kind of return to authenticity as a style and to craft as a particular kind of style, but we're still very aware of them as styles. Well, uh, let me, uh, as with Ed, give you a final say as we wrap up here. Uh, but when you talk about the return uh, to authenticity or, or whatnot, uh, I was going to ask uh, if you do agree with Ed that uh, uh, this is post uh, postmodernism. Um, do you think that there is going to be a return to what you would call the new critical ideal? As I said earlier, I think the new critics uh, had the right idea. They they just weren't inclusive enough to apply their ideas. Uh, on a broad enough scale that we're going to, that we could, for example, look at, uh, for example, uh, Herson's language or, or Reed's language and say, well, you know, black people don't act like that. And even if you're a black writer, writing black picking any characters or, or whatnot is still not cool. Uh, you know, but you, unless you're putting it in a larger context, in other words, are we, are we moving back to an era that, uh, uh, you know, 90 years or 80 years after new criticism arose that we're getting back to that, except we're going to be up at a more broad-based uh, multicultural level. Because I think multiculturalism is a good thing. I think, though, what it has done a lot of times, and, and it's a, a part of the postmodern movement, is that we've replaced, you know, the the, the old boss with a new boss. It's just a new set of dicta that are, are trying to restrain real creativity. So are we moving back to sort of a new criticism, do you think? And then any closing remarks? In, in criticism or in literature? You mean in criticism? The, using the new critis, critical ideals, but in a broader sense, in a, in a, you know, taking the best of multiculturalism and new criticism and sort of merging the two. Um, I think they're difficult to merge in some sense. I mean, there's obviously works of, of new criticism like William Empson's um, uh, versions of pastoral that I still really enjoy and find useful. But I mean, some of the basic assumptions and procedures of new criticism, I, I think, have been discarded and have been discarded for good. I mean, the idea that the work of art is somehow a whole that adds up and that is an organic organic whole, I think, I think it's something that would be very difficult um, to return to after, um, after the emphasis over the last 50 years or so on the way in which 
each work of art is in some sense a patchwork of different influences and draws on different models and merges them in, in new ways. Um, by the same token, I mean, one of the things that I think people were most dissatisfied about with the new criticism was the emphasis on close reading to the exclusion of attention to historical and social context. And I think that would be really difficult to go back to precisely because we know, and that's very difficult to go back to under the sign of, of multiculturalism because one of the one of the corollaries arguably of a multicultural perspective on literary criticism is precisely that you're conscious of um, what particular social context and, and what historical framework um, and what kinds of ideological assumptions a particular text is being put forward from. I mean, that's that's sort of the essence, I think, of of um, of a, and I wouldn't call it multiculturalism at this point, which to me is a term that again is super useful, but like postmodernism, may be quite dated, but a comparative framework. Um, and so, um, and so, I think those are assumptions of of new criticism that are that are really difficult to go back to at this point. And also speaking as a comparatist, I should say that the new criticism has never been the norm outside of Great Britain and the United States. In Germany, there's always been a very sustained um, strain of Marxist informed or otherwise historically informed criticism that has been much more the norm. Um, and that has produced some of the really stellar works of of uh, German origin literary criticism in the 20th century. So something like Erich Auerbach's um, Mimesis or his um, even more importantly work that, that I read when I was a graduate student of French literature. He wrote a book called La Cour et la Ville, the, the, the Court and the City, um, which was a very, very, um, uh, very, very sociological study in some sense of the audience for classical French drama. Um, so, and in Spanish and Latin American criticism too, I think historical and political criticism has been much more the norm throughout the 20th century than the kind of um, uh, close reading focused criticism that focuses on the text at the expense of historical and social context that for a while was the norm in, in Great Britain, sort of between the 1930s and the 1960s, um, and then uh, became the norm for a while in American literary criticism, um, sort of in the, with a big wave of expansion of English departments as a consequence of the GI Bill in the 1960s. So I think when you look at it, from a comparatist context, um, that emphasis on the close reading of texts as the be all and end all of literary criticism internationally is totally the exception rather than the rule. So on those grounds too, I sort of doubt that we're ever gonna go back to anything like new criticism, um, which is not to say that, you know, some of the skills that we learn from, from new criticism and that, you know, some of us still like to teach our students aren't useful. But I would always teach them in conjunction with, with other kinds of skills. Well, uh, as with Edward, I will link to Ursula's website. It's U-H-E-I-S-E -E dot net. You can uh, read more or find out more about her uh, there. And as with Edward, I want to thank you for spending some time to talk about it. Thank you, Dan. This was really fun.